Hello, welcome to the Hybrid Ministries Tech Forum, and welcome to our premiere episode. Um, you may find that our first few episodes might look a little rough around the edges. The transitions might not look a little smooth. Um, things may go awry. This is uh, not entirely by accident. Um, along the way, we're going to work towards establishing some baseline quality standards, and we want you to experience the difference in whether they add, whether you think they add value to our presentation as we improve. Uh, more importantly, um, we'll be demonstrating, oh, I'm um, demonstrating the importance of these quality baseline standards and, and whether they will add value to your presentation. Uh, we're also working with some very new cutting edge technologies that can not only elevate the Zoom experience of your webcast, but make it much easier to control and to operate. And we'll discuss the and showcase these um, along the journey together that we're taking. So over the next several weeks. So why are we here? Um, now that we can begin to see the light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel, uh, we can reflect on the impact that virtual worship has had on our churches, on our members, and on our visitors. What differences have you noticed about your Sunday attendance between the before times and now? Are you noticing that people are tuning in who wouldn't or couldn't otherwise have attended in person? How is this, how will this influence your approach to post-COVID church? During this series of shows, we will explore many of the aspects of planning, gearing up for and executing live webcast for services, for meetings, for classes, and for events such as concerts and rentals. We'll talk about the motivations and justifications for presenting a webcast with a determined level of quality. We'll talk about funding, financing, hardware, software, middleware, what's that? And how they all fit together, the workflow and the people that it can take to make it all work. Now I know that all sounds like it could be terribly complicated, but we're gonna break it down for you to the point where even a small congregation can do a really good looking, good sounding, engaging production. Now, I'm not an expert in all things. None of us here on the panel are either. None of us really can be, nor do I think we really ever want to be. So we've brought together a distinguished panel of people who each bring their own broad set of professional talents and experiences. You'll be able to find everyone's bio in the Discord, which I'll get to in just a moment. While some of us on the panel are available for, cons for consulting and contracting, this show is not about us. It is entirely about you. And it's your questions and comments that will drive the show's agenda and the topics that we discuss over however long this journey takes us. And the panel is open. If you think that you can add value or an alternate viewpoint to our panel, then contact me on the Discord and we'll talk. Before we get started, first order of business is an orientation. Please keep your microphones muted throughout the show. In fact, I'm, I don't even think you'll be able to unmute them, which is okay. During the Q&A time, um, we will read questions that you've entered into the Discord, which we'll get to again in a moment. So all questions will be directed, will be written in the Discord. There is a channel called Questions for the Panelists. Also in the Discord, you'll find a section of guidelines and rules. Please familiarize themselves with yourselves with them. Consider this a professional space. We intend for the information that you'll find there to be concise and on topic to make it easy for you to review later and find value in it. Now, please use your real first and last names and your city as your Zoom screen name and as your Discord nickname. To do this in Zoom, 
simply right click on your own video frame or click on the three dots in the upper right corner and select change name. I'll go over how to do this in Discord as well. So we will not be using the, uh, the Zoom chat window today, except for today, and only for helping you to get oriented and set up on the Discord. So if you have any trouble, put it in the Zoom chat. Otherwise, everything else needs to go in Discord. Um, that's the channel we'll be using. And not only will it be for chats and questions, but it'll, it's a 24-7 platform for information sharing, for discussion between you and us and between yourselves, and for curated reference information that we, the panelists, will provide to you. The topics that we'll be discussing along the way are mostly listed already in the Discord under topics and uh, categories. So let's go over the Discord. And see what the user interface is like. We're going to start here on the right hand panel. This is a list of all of the members that are logged into our Discord here. Those that are in green are our co hosts. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, below that, you'll see is online. These are people who are actively uh, logged on to the Discord. And then under, under that is offline. These are people who are not currently logged on. If you find your name and right click on it, a menu will come up with a several options. And one of them will be change nickname. So this is how you change your name as everybody sees it. You'll also be able to access certain other settings for your profile. If you left click on any name, you'll see that there is a field down here where you can send a one-to-one -one message to that person and have a private conversation. Over here in the center section, this is where all the conversation is happening. So on any channel, on any given channel, this is, this is where you send and receive information. And you can, if you're looking at a certain um, hey, Marty, message, you can th there, there are people, Marty, asking for a valid invite. There, I guess the, the Discord invitation says invalid for people still. How can people get that? I will put that Thanks. right here. Now, this is not something that everybody can do. I will put that in the Zoom chat. Let me get back to Zoom. Right there. All right. So I just put the invitation to Zoom in the Zoom chat and everybody here. So I can't seem to find anything about setting up password and the registration acknowledgement. Well, see if somebody can help Christopher with that. Um, to the left of the message channel is <clears throat> the section where you can find all of the categories and topics for having on-target discussions. So there's the generals channel. These can be collapsed and expanded. And any channel that you see that is highlighted in white means that there have, have been activity on that channel since the last time you looked at it. Anything is gray means there's no activity there. Channels are prefixed by a hashtag. And the categories that they're in are prefixed by a little caret. It is either pointed to the right if it's collapsed or pointed down if it's expanded. So
some of the categories have a channel that is preceded by a loudspeaker. And that says voice when you hover over it. This is a voice chat channel that you can have impromptu discussions. And I see Karen B just logged on to the strategic channels chat channel. And what happens is if you click on that, you'll see down here, it says voice connected. And you can also turn on your video and have a video conversation and you disconnect it right here. All right. From here, oh, um, for each of these channels and a category, if you were to right click on it, you can set certain settings about that category or about that channel. And one of them is notifications. So if there's new activity on a channel, you can get a notification on your screen if you have Discord um, loaded. You can mute it if you like so that you don't get bothered. Over on the left here, this is um, various Discord servers, their various platforms. Ours is this one right here. And if you were to right click on that, you would have a certain uh, menu of settings. Now yours may look different than mine, but this is where you can set certain parameters and set yourself up. All right, that is the Discord. Let me get back to where we are today. Okay. Well, it may, may look a little confusing. Um, there is a channel, let's see. I did put a, an explanation of this into one of these channels and I will find it for you. And it's basically what I just explained, um, but in text so you can go back and read it. So, let's get the ball rolling. Um, it's been quite a year, hasn't it? If, I, if anybody had approached you before March of 2020 and said, let's put our church on the web, let's webcast our services, um, how would that have gone over? Um, Probably not many who would have taken up that challenge. Why? Well, I think it's pretty amazing that within a, just a couple of days, pretty much every church has figured out, had to figure out how to do just that, become an instant production company and get virtual services on the web for your members and your guests. And by the grace of ingenuity and creativity and hard work and technology, you did it. And mostly with existing staff and volunteers. That's an amazing feat, you know. And hard as that has been, if this were five years ago, all these fun, free, low-cost technology things that we're using, they weren't available. What would the impact of the COVID shutdown been to our churches if it had been five years ago? How many visitors are you getting every week? And where are they coming from? You know, I've been, I've been marveling at the redefining and the reinvention of what church looks like during this pandemic and how it's presented and how people are engaging with it. So how important is it to continue this? How important is the quality of your presentation and doing a hybrid mix of live from the sanctuary, pre-recorded, remote contribution, people who, want to, uh, who are assigned to participate in the service but can't be in the sanctuary at the same time. And how important is it and in what ways can we find to bring the two different communities, those are in the sanctuary and those that are watching online together? How can we create that engagement, that interactivity? So 
I'm going to open this up to the panelists for a conversation at this point. Um, why is it really important for us, for churches to continue doing live streaming in the first place? Joanna? Hi there. Inclusivity would be my first reaction to that, to make sure that everyone has access, even the people that can't make it to the church. Um, that's all I wanted to say. So I've, I've talked to a lot of churches and watched a lot of services and I'm, I'm hearing reports that members who have long ago left their church, who moved away to other cities and other towns, are, are now back in and watching services. They're, they're interacting. They're, they're becoming like members again. I've talked to, to churches who have actually signed new members to their books who are somewhere across the country. And, and may never ever set foot into the sanctuary, except on maybe vacation visits. Um, these, are, these are a brand new category of community. It's an opportunity to redefine, rethink what, your, what communities your church is serving. Uh, and do you want to let these people go? Do you want to not serve them anymore, that's probably uh, not a missed opportunity. Um, Mark, did you have something to say? I was going to say um, part of the inclusivity thing is we've, we've had many members of our church move away, um, <clears throat> some of them choir members. As a result of the online services, they've re-engaged and have become members of the choir again because we're producing our music virtually. Um, our choir director is actually here right now. Um, to be able to reconnect with these past members that were very active in the church and have them involved again has been terrific. Um, and uh, so that's that. I've also been... Um... I've also noticed a very, very uh, broad range of thoughts and presentations of, of what hybrids, uh, what virtual services have looked like. I've seen everything from very highly produced, pre-programmed stuff that was, um, that are pre-recorded and played uh, as if live, and with mixes of uh, different people participating, uh, lots of good music, and then I've seen some churches do a presentation where there's one camera on a tripod that's fixed on the pulpit, and that's the entire 45-minute service as people walk in and out of the pulpit. Um, so how important is presentation, and what difference does it make? whether you do a, a, a good looking, good sounding production or something that's really simple. Well, so, and, and how do we get to a point where we can distinguish what makes a difference? Any presentation uh, the, the, is going to affect people in um, one way or another, but chances are that um, people will remember what they experienced in your presentation. They'll comprehend it. They'll remember it more if you've made a difference in how they feel. More important even than what was said. And how people, how you affect how people feel is a very subconscious thing. They're, they may not even be aware of it. But for example, so I am talking to you as I'm looking into the camera, as if I'm looking directly at you in this conversation. But if I'm um, 
talking to you while I'm looking down here at my laptop or if I'm reading a script, that gives you a completely different impression about how intentional I am being with you. Now, the reason that you don't see careless video, well, actually, I do see careless video all the time on broadcast television, but for the most part, it is very well thought out and very well planned because they understand that they are talking directly to their audience and trying to keep that audience engaged in what they're presenting. But there's a difference between broadcasting and what we are trying to accomplish here. And that is that broadcast is always a one-way experience. You can't interact with the people on camera in any effective way. But webcasting is an entirely interactive experience. So we're, while we're talking, you are writing to us on the Discord, and we can have different people asking questions and engaging in conversation. That is the kind of engagement that webcasting affords us, and interactive webcasting affords us, like platforms here on Zoom, instead of more direct one-way uh, platforms like YouTube, for instance. Not to single out YouTube, but as an example. Do we have any questions from the panel, uh, from the audience? I don't see any questions yet, Marty, but I just well, wanted to Marty, now questions. that we have everybody um, or, or the majority of people who've joined us, I think it would be great if maybe you could tell people a little bit who you are. And I mean, I don't, the notion that we're all together in this big Zoom meeting, but some of us are panelists, it might be good just to kind of affirm the fact that the format for the show, as you've kind of set it up, is for each episode, you have a certain number of people who are kind of like pre-identified as panelists, right? So kind of having, we're having, going to have a little bit of discussion or starting to, and then we're going to open it up, right? Is that how we're going? That's a good idea. Thank you very much. And who are you? Because you, can I just say, me? Wait, wait, let me just say, because I tend to be a big cheerleader. Thank you to everyone for being here. We have how many people is it? Over 80, 80 84 people. Um, and I just know that um, working with congregations and media and strategy and various things that I do. I, I know how hungry for information, ideas and strategy you all are and how hard you've all been working, staff and volunteers. And as someone who doesn't do too much with like the, like the physical technology, I'm more strategy um, and content. Marty and others have organized this amazing conversation and ongoing forum. So while like, we're, we're ramping up i would want to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity to thank marty and the other panelists um, who are really launching this effort which i think long term is going to be such a fantastic resource for us to support each other and our congregations and get the information we need to adapt and figure out these different issues and figure out how to move forward regardless of what comes timeline the pandemic so thank you marty and everyone else Yes, I have to thank, uh, thank you, Peter, and I have to thank the, the entire panel because we have some amazing people here who are musicians and technologists and theologians and consultants and media creators, and we're going to hear from everybody along the way. Um, today is an introduction and an orientation to the program, and what we have planned is actually quite dynamic. You, So I am... I've been in the media production and engineering industry for over 45 years. I've worked in recording studios, television, radio, um, live music mixing, live, live concerts. I've done, um, I, I am a, a systems designer and installation company. Uh, so very well rounded and um, some people in the DC, Virginia area know me because I've, I've done some work for them. Um, but what we have planned for this show after this orientation is to cover many of the topics, all of the topics that you'll see listed in the Discord 
the strategic questions, the technical questions. Um, we're going to get into a lot of technical stuff like, you know, what kind of cameras do I need? Uh, how many cameras do I need? Um, how do I mix those cameras? How do I um, process those cameras? What kind of lighting is important? Is lighting important? And how do I think about that? Um, how do I how do I get my production onto the web? What streaming service should I use? Um, should I use Zoom? Should I use something else? How do I think about sound for that? Sound is a completely different animal when you're talking about broadcasting or streaming versus sound that's strictly contained within the room. Uh, we'll talk about <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about um, interactivity between the two communities and how to accomplish that. So there'll be a lot of things that we'll be able to talk about. And um, we have people from all over the country. In fact, we have people signed up for registered for this event from two different continents. Uh, we have people who registered from Europe where it's now after midnight. Um, so good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Let's, let's take a look at some of those topics, shall we? Marty, I wanted to reinforce that the topics we'll be covering go beyond technical issues. They involve uh, roles, policies and procedures, tools for managing your meetings, um, how to approach the board of directors for financing. There will be a broad variety of topics surrounding all of this, not just the, not just the technical aspects. That's true. That's true. We'll be covering. We can be covering issues such as copyright licensing. We'll. One of the most important things is workflow and scheduling and software that help organize uh, webcasts. Um, when you're Everybody knows from, uh, especially ministers, uh, when you're doing a Sunday service, um, how important it is to schedule yourself and have your uh, worship team on board and um, your worship associates um, fully informed and your music director um, aware of what the sermon topic is going to be for a Sunday so that they have time to prepare music. Um, your audio video people should be aware of what your needs are in advance so that you're not, they're not scrambling to get you ready for Sunday, uh, on Sunday morning. So when you're doing a webcast, there are more moving parts that need to be planned out and scheduled in advance. So we call this, we call this workflow. Now, a lot of people who are uh, doing virtual worship are, have become familiar with uh, schedules and deadlines for getting things done, especially if you're producing music and virtual choirs and such. Um, so we'll cover, we'll cover workflow. We'll cover the special needs of smaller churches who are running on a tighter budget and um, how they can produce a pretty good looking show, even on a budget. Uh, we'll be talking about the value conversations, you know, how to, how to get that level of commitment from your congregation, from your board. And we'll be talking about different ways to uh, think about financing the equipment that you may need to purchase, right? Um, and if any of our attendees here have ideas or special needs or um, pressing issues that they would like the panel to discuss, Please put them in the Discord. There is a, uh, under the generals category, there's a, a channel for show topic ideas. Um, this is where you, we want to hear from you about steering our conversation so that we can provide information back to you. And 
Let's see. So who has, so I, I would like to hear from our attendees, what is the biggest obstacle that you're facing to achieving hybrid church? Is it technical? Is it volunteerism? Is it funding? Is it commitment? Is it strategy? What's important to you? What are your biggest challenges? And while we're waiting for that, um, let's, uh, let's hear from somebody on the panel. One of the, one of the most challenging things, I think, even for, if, for live, for those of us who are doing virtual services live rather than pre-recorded, one of the more challenging thing, things are uh, technology oriented. Like it takes somebody to be spotlighting, it takes somebody to be muting, it takes somebody to watch the chats. Uh, there's a chat monitor. Um, there's somebody who is playing back pre-recorded material and not everything always goes well. So what are some ideas to help make some of these things easier? David O'Connor. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm David. Um, I am with First Unitarian of Philadelphia, and um, I am kind of a, lightly a technician. I come from theater and have like a sort of technical background there. What I'm used to is like seeing a problem and just like jumping in and fixing it and figuring out what I need, the barren need to get this done and move on to the next thing. Uh, I imagine that's where a lot of us are. It's just like, what's the, how do I figure out the bare skills that I need to get this done? Um, and uh, to that end, I, I sort of jumped in and, and sort of spearheading the, what we call the tech team, the, the people who put on our, our Zoom shows each week. Um, and they are interactive, they are hybrid, they are webcast in the, in the way that Marty was describing. There's a high um, back and forth involvement through chat and through um, uh, and wide, wide variety of voices um, brought forth from the congregation. Um, like all of you have been describing, far flung members um, are, are able to, to stay connected all the time. Um, yeah, each Sunday is, at least like broadly national, national, not international. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are, are having a similar experience. Um, where to your question, Marty, of like, what is the biggest obstacle right now? Um, I think for, for me anyway, what I, what, I, what I feel to be the biggest obstacle, because um, I think once we know what we're doing, um, we'll be able to do it um, with, uh, you know, these continued discussions to get into some of the nitty gritty and uh, all the other ways that we we reached out and find information and share with each other on how to get things done. Um, the biggest thing I'm, I'm thinking about is just bringing um, bringing a, a very disparate and thoughtful group of people that is our congregation together to find some kind of consensus about what we want to be now. And that's like the that's the biggest question. I mean, I I, I think this moment of you know. Where, where is the congregation now? I think for, for a long time, we, we very much associated with our building and which is, has a historic significance in Philadelphia. Um, and so there's a lot of like pride in the history of the building and the history of the congregation. And it, was, it feels very tied in a meaningful way to the building. And I think there's a way that that's, I don't know, uh, there's, there's like a cat's out of the bag now in a way and, and things are just different. Um, and where the congregation is and where it's centered and where the heart is, is just in a different place. And sort of uh, identifying that and, and having, having the form of our, not just our worship, but our congregational life together, um, kind of reflect that, that difference is, is really interesting. And the, the hardest thing I think is like gathering an articulated consensus around that. That to me is like the biggest daunting challenge right now. Joanne. Hi, I'm Joanne Masterson, and I'm the um, technical and organizational communications lead at Mount Vernon Unitarian Church in Alexandria, Virginia. 
I'm so glad to see everybody here. One of our challenges that you um, touched on, Marty, was um, you have, like you said, um, like David said, the cat is out of the bag. Now many of us can see what we can do. We can see that we can reach more people. We've done this sooner, faster than we would have voluntarily. And now we have two questions. You know, one is kind of the philosophical, like how, what kind of church do we want to be? How do we want to conduct digital ministry? And the other is very practical. So you had asked, you know, how do we offer this hybrid service? And someone in the chat said beautifully something that really we need to discuss and that, that it is a church service. It isn't an entertainment production. It isn't a, uh, it's worship, it's, it's fellowship. If, if it's not worship for you, it's a community gathering. So it really isn't a show. And one of the things that you had asked Marty was how do we, what helps, you know, when people come with their varied expectations, you know, hundred people have hundred expectations or maybe they have 200 expectations. One of the things that's really helped our congregation, especially me in the hot seat of having to get the production going week after week with no notice, like literally three days notice, like we're take, we're closing the church, your communications share. What are you going to do? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll make some phone calls. We'll get something going for Sunday. Um, the thing that really helped us and helped me as a volunteer is having a point person for the community to talk to when they ha are upset about the quality of the production or upset about what the minister said because they can't go talk to the minister after church. Um, or they didn't get to hear one, you know, we're all community members and, and, and I, I love all of the community members, but I'm in the directory. So I get telephone calls any time of day. You know, I can't, I can't get my, I can't get, I'm having a technical problem. Can you help me? So it really helped us. And I hope that other people will consider structuring a contact person. In our case, it's the minister for the most uh, upset people because it's part of your ministry now dealing with digital grief <laughs> digital frustration um, the disgruntled people who are disappointed that the quality isn't show like it's volunteer it's a little clunky sometimes you know the screen goes black for a second before the screen share starts so we need to have each other's back you know we need to continue our um, you know, it, it helps if the, if the uh, spiritual leaders can remember to attend to this as, a, as part of the fellowship, an extension of the fellowship, and not a show. Well, of course, I think it goes with, it is worth saying that, yes, we are supporting fellowship we are supporting worship we are supporting people and that is the ultimate goal of everything that we are trying to accomplish and most of that goes towards content and format getting that content and format to your congregation is the technical part of it. And not just the technical part of it, but figuring out how to make that engaging and technology plays a big part in that as well. Um, so where it's not an entertainment show per se, Although, you know, there are some worship leaders who might disagree with that. <laughs> um, I've been thinking a lot about, just because my technology brain looks at things this way, um, you know, there are very large churches 
who attract thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And they spend millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars on technology. And, you know, I, I wonder and I think about and I talk to people about, well, why do they why do they spend all this money on technology? Is it really benefiting them? And how does it impact their congregations? Are they spending it simply because they have the money? Or is there something about the technology that we don't realize or we don't understand? Is it technology for technology's sake? Or is it technology for a purpose? So that's, that's something we can think about and talk about. And I'd be interested in hearing people's perspective on that question. Um, one thought that comes to mind is that they attract a very large online audience. And I think they have an understanding that their audience will respond to the best presentation they can provide them. Um, as I mentioned before, on any given Sunday, I'll bounce around and, and watch four, five, six different services. And, you know, on any other day, I can go to YouTube or different websites and watch some more services. So as you do this, you look at the difference and you may notice the difference in the presentation quality and the format um, and the smoothness and the professionalness and the audio quality. And you'll notice the differences in the presentation. And if I were looking for a church, if I were shopping for a church, it would be so easy for me these days because I don't need to schedule my time to go to this church on one Sunday, that church on another Sunday. I can visit all these churches on the same day and may not matter to everybody, but I think that the quality of the presentation will tell me a lot about the intention of that church to pull me in. Um, that makes a difference to me. Joanne, uh, let's go to Jay first and then Joanne. Thanks. Uh I'm Jay Paul. I'm with uh, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Columbia, Maryland. Um, so uh, there's a, a question in the chat that I think ties in really well to what you, you just uh, discussed regarding uh, the question was, how do we convince the ministers to support online services? And to your point, Marty, um, it's very easy to, uh, to go out and experience uh, services from a variety of uh, uh, different congregations. It, it, it would certainly, um, uh, you know, behoove anybody who's who's either not doing it and considering it, or wants to gauge uh, how well uh, a service conveys uh, online using uh, whatever technology it is, whether whether it's it, it's Zoom or or Facebook, and also to gauge uh, the production values to uh, if the congregation does an online chat. For a coffee hour after the service to be able to engage members of the conversation uh, of the congregation, um, you know, either verbally or, or through chat, you know, how do you like what you do? Is there anything missing? Um, I, I think there's a lot of uh, compelling um, conversations that could be brought to ministers who are hesitant to move into the online world, and and at this point. If you're, uh, you know, in in Maryland, we've been we've been uh, limited to uh, the number of people that that can congregate. We went online in April. We we have not gone back to uh, to our sanctuary for a service yet. We will eventually move towards a hybrid service. Now that we've gone online, we're never we're never going to have a time where we won't be able to to connect with our congregants remotely. Um, so we're certainly thinking about and planning that next step. Uh, but I don't think any of us could ever conceive of uh, having gone through this pandemic without uh, being able to con uh, to communicate with uh, our congregation and bring the service into their living rooms. Thank you. 
I agree with all of that. Um, I have a unique situation where I'm not on staff at any one church right now. So on any given Sunday morning, I can go to four, five, or six different services and check them out. And, uh, and I actually often do that. And the thing that one of the things that I notice that is if I feel engaged, which was Marty's point about feeling like you're present and in the moment, I won't leave. That's what keeps me there. And there are so many factors that go into making you feel comfortable enough and relaxed enough to say, oh, okay, now I can listen to the message. Now I can listen to the music. And there are things that take you out of that. And some of them are technical, but some of them are just not connecting. And every, every congregation I go to has their own way of doing, of reaching out. And some congregations do it better than others. And I feel like th this, that's one of the reasons why we're all here to discuss this in a forum setting. I think it's a uh, crucial, I think it's a crucial to keep your congregation growing and to keep your congregation connected and connected to the community in order to, to provide a compelling worship service. And as the other part of uh, uh, starting to use your building again for rentals and things like that, we talked about that a while ago too. Um, some, some congregations are losing their income for not being able to rent out their buildings. If you can provide a system that lets you broadcast from your sanctuary, you're, you're still able to, to bring in some rental income. Thank you, Joanne and, uh, Jay and Joanne. Um, yeah, there's some very interesting things in, in what you've said. Um, engagement, uh, again, is a very subtle thing. Uh, whether you're in person in service or watching online, uh, engagement is something that can easily be broken by distractions. Um, something goes wrong, um, you know, and a very obvious thing is if you're sitting in the sanctuary and the fire alarm goes off, you've lost people's attention. Um, if, uh, you know, we, we don't mind the sound of babies crying, but if there's somebody being disruptive in the sanctuary, that's very, well, that's why we use the word disruptive. Um, to be engaged means to be fully engaged and holding your attention. And distractions can even subconsciously uh, help you to lose people. So, to provide a very smooth, well-planned out, very well-rehearsed, very technically adapt or adept production doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be smoke and mirrors, but it is well-controlled and very intentional and well-rehearsed so that you're avoiding disruptions and, dis and uh, distractions. So what are, you also mentioned uh, something along the ways of opportunities for providing web streaming. Um, even post COVID. Marty, if I, if, if, if I might interject, um, zooming out a little bit on, on all of this, there's, there's a lot of comments about you know, we've, we've kind of gone down the how to make this smooth, um, clean, um, presentable, but I think we should zoom out a little bit. There's a lot of comments uh, flying by in the, in the questions about how do I decide what, do I, what I need? How do I get the gear in house? How do I staff all of this? Um, and if we, if we take a look at the, the whole issue, from the same point of view that perhaps you and me and Jay are familiar with as an integration house, how do you go about helping a congregation? And I've, Jay and I have both done many houses of worship in our careers. Um, the very first step is discovery. Um, having a conversation with the people that matter, whether that's the congregation, the board of directors, the, the minister, find out what the value sets are for that congregation. Um, part of the value sets naturally include how much money do they have to spend? How much money are they willing to spend on this effort? Um, 
what are the things they're trying to accomplish by going into streaming or interactive streaming, hybrid, et cetera. Um, a lot of that will determine what gear you ultimately end up purchasing. Now, for example, the congregation that I'm in, they do the virtually the entire service with a combination of, I think it's five uh, devices, whether they're full-blown computers, iPods, cell phones focused on the chalice, things like that. And they manage the entire service with some fairly inexpensive gear and run a pretty smooth service. Um, some places might want to do that up a bit more, um, especially when we get back to a live environment. Um, music's going to be a little more difficult, especially in a Zoom environment, which isn't necessarily always friendly to live music. Um, so doing first the discovery, engaging a consultant of some sort that can help guide you toward the gear you need to fulfill those goals that you have within the budget that you have available to you. And that's great, a gear list is wonderful and knowing what the price is is wonderful, but okay, who's gonna, who's gonna provide the gear, who's going to install the gear, who's gonna train the staff to operate the gear? Um, this is where either engaging a consultancy or um, hopefully out of this group here, you know, there's, there's at least three consultants sitting here that I can see right now, um, can help with all of that. And we can help guide people toward who to buy the stuff from that will also be able to install it um, and provide the training for all of this. Part of what we hope to be discussing here is also fairly inexpensive tricks and uh, pieces of equipment um, that will make operation of the, the process much easier. Things like using a stream deck, which is a very powerful, very inexpensive little tool for doing all of this and automating it. Um, we do have a control systems category in the, in the Discord that will talk about control systems, Crestron, AMX, Extron, or simplified things like uh, Vadio makes a, a good system. There's the ATEM switcher, which is a good, there's, there's a variety of ways to go about all of this. Um, hopefully we'll be able to start gathering in for, for various geographic locations, who to go ahead and contact about buying the stuff and getting it. Um, so, the topics of who do you, who and how do you talk to at your congregation about embarking on something like this? And clearly the minister is involved in all of it, but the board of directors has to approve the money. Um, in our congregation, it had been brought up several times in the past and there were board members that said, nope, no way we're gonna stream this. There's privacy issues. We don't want the congregation to feel like they're on display. We don't, uh, you know, the, the, there were a whole lot of privacy and security issues that came up right away. As soon as COVID hit and people started going to church online, all those concerns virtually disappeared, but I, I think the concerns are still there and still valid. For example, we don't broadcast our candles of joy and concern. The Facebook stream, the broadcast stream that we use cuts that out and comes back after candles. But in the Zoom call, which is people that we know, that part is still broadcast to them and we still, we still do it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's hurdles to get over here. Um, Hopefully we can help people figure out how to do the discovery and get the ball rolling. And as this goes, we can provide resources. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, yes, there are, there's, there's a process that uh, many congregations will go through uh, that, uh, that does start with discovery, the needs analysis, establishing what the goal is gonna be right up front so that you know what the road looks like. Um, when you, but it, it does help to have somebody who is experienced uh, like a consultant to help you establish what those goals are because it, it's also, it's helpful to know what the possibility is. What's the potential? What's the potential reward for doing it? 
uh, one way versus another way? What are the benefits? Is it worth it? Um, how do we get, uh, and, and when you establish what your, what your ultimate goal is, which is also part philosophical uh, and theological, because that is going to require the commitments and commitments from the worship team uh, and the music team. If you are going to establish up front that you're going to you're you're going to target a fairly small online community of just your existing members and maybe some former members, um, but you're not really going to be interested in a wider audience. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But it is at least instructive or um, informative to understand that your membership is no longer limited to the dimensions of your sanctuary or the number of pace, places in your parking uh, lot or your geographical location. Uh, you know, there are teleministries, just to give one example, who started in people's living rooms who grew to thousands and thousands and thousands of members. And as we discussed earlier, just from just by the virtue of doing virtual worship, congregations are have already expanded their membership across the country and in some cases internationally. So this is an opportunity for any of our churches to consider that option and that potential benefit to increase increase your membership, but also increase the community of people that you serve. And that would be something that could be of interest to your minister, maybe not. Uh, that's important to establish up front. And, but would need the commitment, the understanding and the commitment of your congregation as a goal and a mission, part of a mission for your church. There was something else that was mentioned. Um, let's see. Integration images throughout. Okay, so. Oh, Marty, I was just going to say that there was a Steve who had his hand up for a long, long time. I don't know if you want to get back to his question or maybe we're beyond that, Steve. The Steve, was it? I lost the picture. Steve P, did you still have a question or want to comment? I think so. Can you... Well, he won't be able to unmute himself. I didn't see himself. it in the box. I'm sorry. Yeah, he. I didn't see it and put it in the Discord box or in the Zoom box. He can put He's just raising his hand. Okay. Hi, Peter. Can you put it in the... <laughs> um, thank you for observing that. I, so, I was on the worship team and the most technical person on the worship team before all this came up. So, I kind of got volunteered to get involved in how we were doing it going forward and i had uh, i've got a really great team of other volunteers who are knowledgeable and also invested in worship to be able to do this where are the, you from steve greensboro north carolina i'm sorry that's that's a that's good right. question um sadie lansdale's our, our minister and she's in her i guess her third or fourth year with us um and She's young and she's also very technical, so that helps. Um, but th the observation I wanted to make was before in the before times, I donated a, a projector so we could do the hymn lyrics in PowerPoint. And we had no idea how effective it was until the bulb burned out. And then I had a dozen people going, what have we got to do to keep this going? And it cost me no money. It was a donated projector that I got for nothing. And I created this. And, and we've, we've done the same thing with what we're doing. Uh, I think everybody on this call probably is doing the same thing for our congregations. Um, we're getting connections with people outside of our physical space 
and our geographical area in ways that we never did before. Um, I'm a member of a congregation that's got 180 members. We've got 17 people interested in joining the church who are new, who we discovered through this. The flip of that, the negative side of that is we've also got a lot of people who aren't technical and don't want to do the Zoom thing that are not participating on Sundays now. We haven't lost them, but they're sort of in limbo. And how do we honor both of those things going forward, I think is what I'm interested in. We've talked about keeping volunteers going in the past, right? There's, uh, if you have a specific task and a specific role, it's uh, often incumbent upon you always every single week to do that same thing. And there is a way to, to pass that role on to the next person, to the next volunteer, make it an easier thing for, the, for that person to be trained on, right? Does anybody agree with that? Make it easy for them to learn how to do that one task. Yes, I, I find that one of the um, obstacles to volunteering, to volunteerism in tech roles is uncertainty. Um, uncertainty right. of the, not, not just uncertainty of the time commitment, because I think that can grow on people, but uncertainty of what's going to be asked of them, what they need to learn and how they're going to, to learn it. Um, that's where training comes in and that's where uh, consolidation of roles comes in and that's where to a certain extent technology comes in that can help to automate some of the multiple functions that have to happen at one time uh, and to make it sim simpler to to do a multi-camera or you know multifunctional operation if we can automate certain functions to make it easier, then, then that's less that people have to be concerned about. David. And I think also as part as, as we found the shape of how we do worship now and how we do the, the, the Zoom and the, um, you know, the camera changing and the music and the video production and all of those aspects, um, you know, it is, it is the, it's all volunteer driven at, at, at our congregation right now. And it's, um, uh, it's worshipful, right? It's part of worship. It's, it's part of service. Um, the rehearsal is part of service. The, the, the preparation is, is part of service. The gathering beforehand to work out everything is, is part of service. It's all just sort of different extensions of that in a way, uh, to us. And that, I think that, um, helps with the, the, the volunteer involvement and retention because um, it's, it's, it's a great space to be in uh, for, for us anyway. Like the, I don't know, for me, the, that Monday morning, 9.30 to 11 before worship starts at 11, formerly with a full congregation, is that's, that's it feels to me like my holiest time. And then the, 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 the worship is, is intellectually charged, but the, in terms of the time where I feel like really connected, it's, it is doing that kind of like intimate behind the scenes work. Indeed, when I'm uh, when I was mixing audio for for church pre COVID, and and our church is pretty involved in service. Um, big music component. Our the music director was fabulous. The choir was fabulous. We had multiple performing groups doing music. Um, that was setting all of that up getting it all tuned in tuned up sounding right um, making it sound making those performers sound as good as i can get them to sound in that space uh, and watching the congregation really enjoy what every part of the service that there is whether it be a homily or even the weekly announcements as well as music that is a was a very spiritual practice for me um, 
getting all of that done and knowing that I am directly participating and facilitating uh, the congregation getting the most out of that service. That, that to me was like its own reward and its own spiritual practice. Jay. Without question. So I can, I can relate to that having spent uh, a majority of my life behind mixing consoles at one time or another. But now that we're in our new remote pandemic world, uh, you know, musicians don't have us as technicians right in front of them to handle their technology and pay our focused attention on their sound, make live dynamic changes during a performance. Um, you know, we're not there anymore. So uh, I, I think one of the challenges, and, and this, I, I'm going to assume that this is common uh, amongst uh, all of us, uh, your musicians uh, have now have had to become uh, technical uh, personnel. They're, you know, maybe, maybe you know, if they, they per, per went out and performed live, they bring their own sound system, they learned how their gear worked, they'd set it up, they would do a performance, put it back in the car and, and head home. Um, they were in the space where they performed, the room acoustics were something they were always aware of because they were within that physical space. Now uh, they're performing distantly. Uh, and it, what I think I found is that uh, there, there was a, as, as rapidly as many of us had to adopt to bring this technology, uh, learn it, and then uh, start uh, casting our services out. Um, I've spent a lot of time working with musicians, helping them find, you know, uh, you either use the things they had or acquire new equipment, sound check, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, what room they set up in, if they're doing an acoustic performance, uh, all those things, what kind of a, it, the, the interface, the microphone preamp gain settings, I mean, the, you know, and on and on. There's a lot of different parts and pieces uh, in order for a musician to present themselves. And uh, I, you know, yet another, it's, a, it's another challenge. And, and I've, I've watched a couple of comments uh, in the chats about, well, large congregation versus small congregation, you know, that really doesn't matter when the, you know, musicians are now remote. They're all now sitting in a room and they're, and they're either uh, live performing uh, material during a service, maybe they're pre-recording uh, and forwarding it on. At least when you pre-record, at least you can go back and listen to the performance uh, and, and evaluate it or edit it or redo it. Uh, when we're doing it live and you're sending it out, uh, they're just looking for feedback back. How was it? Could you hear me? Was there, uh, were you happy with the quality? And, you know, for musicians um, and for any everybody, really, um, you know, we want to, uh, we strive to make sure that we deliver the best product we can um, and that communication back to them, helping them, coaching them to make sure they're delivering to the standards uh, that they hold so that they can support your congregation. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a confirmation of that people who um, participate in AV production uh, really are in a unique place because they get to see and hear the their work and their their contribution and they can really get a visceral sense of the appreciation from the people that um, are hearing and seeing what they're doing and it's 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 an interesting thing that when it comes to sound production um, the the person who is controlling sound is completely invisible to, to the audience when everything goes right. They're only visible to the audience when something goes wrong. And, <laughs> you know, that that's a very curious thing. It's like, um, you know, some people will say sounds great as they're walking out of the sanctuary, but, you know, when, when nobody 
comes up and compliments you, <laughs> you thinking, oh my goodness, did something go wrong? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> my friend Michelle, when she was doing a sound check, I, I said, Michelle, I don't know how you get up there and take an original song and you just get up there and you perform it. And here you are still working out details. I could never do what you do. And she just looked at me and she said, I'm a performer. People expect me to screw up. But when you mess up, every head in the room turns and looks at you. I was like, oh, thanks. No pressure there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I see there have been a couple of a uh, couple of people commenting about this interesting uh, meter that we have running in one of the Zoom boxes. Um, this is a, this is a, a, an audio level meter that I have that will that that is for the panelists that shows us that all of our audio levels are consistent. Um, hopefully you might have noticed that when I'm talking or when any of the other panelists are talking, you don't have to go and adjust your volume on your computer because we're all talking at the same volume. And that's one of the biggest distractions that I have found as I'm looking at different congregation services is that when you know, somebody is is participating. Somebody is uh, has the floor for virtual service, and they're you know reading something or doing something or performing something at one level, and then you know it's thrown to the next person for the next segment, and either their audio level is way below or way above the one before, and I have to go and adjust the volume level. That that's a distraction. That's an example of a distraction. Because every time you reach for that, you're thinking about something else than what is being presented to me, right? Um, so this is part of quality control. This is part of technical planning. Um, and this is part of that in ensuring engagement through providing consistency. Um, so I wanted to point that out. This particular meter is called the Yulian loudness meter. There is a free version online. Um, but there are a number of other meters that can perform very similar functions. I put a link to that software in the audio and um, under the, uh, the audio channel under technical. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. Um, so here's an interesting thing uh, and, and goes towards uh, very heavily towards engagement. So we started this show at seven, roughly seven o'clock. And, you know, as everybody logged in, they were brought to the waiting room and everybody sat in the waiting room until we uh, let everybody in. And I noticed that after we started the show, there were more people and more people that came in. And, you know, those people who were here originally were we started the show cold. There was no music. There was no uh, prior introduction. There was no pre-show. There was no prelude. So without really the benefit of a crystal ball, um, Silver Spring Church, who I was a member of, uh, started just about 10 years ago to record every service, every musical piece, didn't matter whether it was we were going to do anything with it or not. Um, as Jay was suggesting a few minutes ago and saying that we're just going to record everything. And, and the original thought was, well, we can, we can provide these back to the musical performers. We can, of course, extract the sermon and put that on the website. Um, but the musical performers can see, you know, how well they did and, and, you know, look at, listen to their performance and, and performance is always a study thing. It's a practice. So you look at what you did and you see what you can improve from the audience's perspective versus your own perspective. Um, but we, we installed the technology to do these recordings on a multi-track recorder. And I've done this for some of our, some of my other church clients as well. 
And when you do that, every single microphone, every single source gets recorded in a separate track, right? And when you have that, then you can go back to that recording and completely remix it because it's done just like it's done in a recording studio where every performer, every guitar, every drum head, every bass, every instrument, every voice, it's recorded separately so that later on in post-production, the engineers can go back and re-blend those different tracks in different ways, add effects to individual tracks, do all kinds of things. And so what we were able to do that you really can't do in a live setting because of the time pressures is I could go back remix those tracks, produce that music so that it really sounds good. I can take out errors. I can correct things. I can add effects like reverb or delay to really like polish it up. And then I put those on a drive, uh, on a cloud drive that the music department could have access to um, just as a, a mixtape, just as a mixtape. Um, but over the years, we found that to be very, very useful um, as we've had to honor certain people who, who left us, who were some of those performers. And we now have that material as part of their legacy for the church. Um, and then COVID hit. And let me tell you, this church, every service now, they have a 30 minute prelude from where they play music from this archive. That's 10 years deep. It includes concerts, performance during services, special performances, uh, music, original music that was composed, um, by church members, all kinds of really, really interesting music that really sounds good and they are now benefiting from. So they have a 30 minute prelude that and people are logging in really early because they really are interested in hearing this stuff. And during the prelude, the chat window is open and people are talking and greeting and saying hello and, and really engaging with each other. And then when the service starts, everybody's warmed up. Everybody is warmed up and ready to go. It's something that, 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 that in the virtual event service, they call warming up the stream. It's like getting everybody ready and engaged before the event starts. So, you know, it was, it was just very off the cuff and yeah, we can do this, so why not? practice of recording all this music. And I'm sure that everybody here from every church now, <laughs> maybe now wishes they would have done that or thought of that. And it's just, well, okay, so now, now you have all this stuff that you have done for virtual services. And you now have that library to build on that you can then use later on during hybrid services. Let's go to Jay. So, um... Interesting. So our congregation um, uses we 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 select uh, gathering music that starts generally about twenty minutes before the service. Uh, we do a uh, uh, we do a Saturday uh, run through from one to two. Uh, it's basically a tech and sound checks and you know spotlighting and listening to pre recorded content. Uh, Etc. And then we do another one nine thirty before our ten a.m. service, uh, and then we time out the gathering music. We we often have a well, not often. We always have a a static uh, slide that stays in place until service starts, and you know then we go right into service. Then we have postlude music after the service. So every, everything is uh, curated uh, towards the the service. Um, so there's there's from the time uh, we let people um, in uh, from the waiting room, 
we enable chat. People chat with each other uh, before the service and uh, do so uh, after the service as well. So people can either, uh, uh, and the other thing I want to point out is we list uh, the the music that we're, we're playing so people know the name of the song, who the performer, composer, both for the uh, the gathering music and at the end of the postlude. So, uh, you know, you, 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 you framed it with a, a, a name for it. Uh, I didn't think about that. We just, can, I think, consider it the gathering music. Uh, and uh, it, it, yeah, I think it's probably a pretty, pretty important feature to get people maybe in the moment of uh, anticipation of the service. Go ahead. Joanna. And your, congreg oh. your congregation also provides an order of service available on their website right next to the Zoom uh, link is the order of service link, which you download and have a PDF up of what's going to happen for the whole service, which I find extremely helpful. All the credits, all the musical credits, who's playing when. It's all right on in two in very two very distinct places on the website. That's a great idea. Just saying. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, and the Silver Spring Church that does this 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 thirty minute prelude, they they put a po a slide up on the screen. Um, they they alternate slides, so there's the um, there's the order of service. There is the and included in the order of service are all the music that's going to be performed. That is the title of the song, the composer of the song, the performer of the song, and if it's from the archive, the year it was it was performed. And uh, and they'll rotate that with uh, announcements and upcoming uh, events and services. So these are slides that rotate during the the prelude um, that that help inform people. It kind of takes the, the the need away from doing uh, announcements, some announcements during the service. Joanna? I, just to piggyback on, on what I said earlier about finding the order of service very easily, uh, there was a question out there about how do you make the people around the world know that you're actually there? Make it very easy to find your link to your service. I dig sometimes. I have to absolutely dig for things to find out how to get to your service that morning. Uh, make it easy. Make it in the same place uh, every week. Put it on your website if you're if you're nervous about putting it up on your Facebook page, which is usually the easiest way to find it. Put it on your website. Here, you know, and, and make it clear as day. You know, worship today or something. Some button that's very clear to have other people be able to join your service and then you will absolutely get people from around the world there was a gentleman before who said there's somebody from vienna who is coming to his services i think that's awesome that's the beautiful thing that's one of the silver linings of of the covid zoom world that we live in yeah i saw that there was somebody registered from france and somebody registered from the uk for this for this show um Going, going back to the fear yes. and trepidation portions of it, one of the interesting uh, phenomena we noticed with our choir was because everyone was recording from home, uh, most of them were recording on uh, cell phones, and it was surprising the, the, the variety of qualities that would come in the door. But what we had to, what we ended up having to tell the choir members was practice it a few times, sing it while you're recording, don't go back and listen. Anyone who's ever been in a studio knows that any individual track, you can sound horrid. But if you're part of a group of people, the mix sounds pretty good. So don't get overly consumed with sounding perfect in your recording. Do a good job. Let it go. And if, they, if the mixer or the music director actually need you to redo it, they'll contact you about it. But when you take 20 voices and you put them all together... They sound way better than any one voice. And we had a lot of people initially say, oh, I tried it. I'm never going to do that again. That was too embarrassing. And it's like, don't worry about it. Just relax. You sounded fine. <laughs> um, but you'll find that performance anxiety I, will creep in because they can hear just themselves. If I could point people on the Discord server to the, the portion where I 
shared many different um, sets of instructions for virtual choirs. Uh, a lot of people have their own set of, of how to explain to choir members the best way to record. But there's a couple of different versions of that available on the Discord server under what channel? It's under, is it under technical? I'm sorry, I don't know what channel it's on, but the information is there. It's And that is a very real thing that people deal with all the time is trying to convince your your choirster that it that their contribution matters and that they should try and to get them past the point of tech errors and and the fear of technology is is a challenge it's always been a challenge. i uh because i've done some content i've done some virtual choirs now i, I find convincing people to submit in this place can be difficult so the Discord channel is music production under technical. Thank you. You're welcome. Very much. Some good resources there. Great. Uh, so it's now um, 8.30. We've been going for an hour and a half. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today for such a wonderful conversation and contributions from the attendees as well. Um, I'm sure that we all hope that, we all hope that you've enjoyed our time together and perhaps you found it informative, enlightening, enriching, and energizing, motivating. Um, this is uh, untrodden ground that most of us are only first exploring with all of the new possibilities and no prior model to own or to, uh, to copy or emulate. So uh, make it your own. Reinvent your ministries, redefine your communities, who you serve, choose to serve. Dare to dream. Um, the Discord is open. We'll see you there. We'll see you next week. Um, our service continues. And uh, bye for now.